morning. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, like she said, my name is Emily. I work for the Florida Fort Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, um, and that is our state agency that manages natural resources um, across state and, uh, waters and land. Uh, and then I work for the Division of Marine Fisheries which uh, oversees a wide variety of things. Um, we work on a lot of rulemaking for saltwater fishing, um, outreach programs about best fishing practices or new regulation changes. Uh, we also have artificial reefs team, which does deployments and then oversees maintenance uh, following deployments. Um, and then we also do some special permitting and then the lionfish program. And so that is specifically what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and we can get into that. Uh, we will uh, do a little bit of background first. And so we're going to define what an invasive species is. Um, so not just lionfish, but other things around our ecosystems. Um, so an invasive species is characterized by two components. First, it is an organism that is brought to a new region by people, um, but second and crucial, it causes negative impacts. So it harms the ecosystem or other species in some form or fashion. And so we've got some examples here um, of Burmese pythons as a terrestrial example and um, hydrilla and kudzu are also um, plants, hydrilla being aquatic and kudzu also terrestrial. Um, but this is also just goes to show that it's not just fish. Um, it can be plants, animals, insects, a bunch of different types of things. Um, but they typically also have some sort of characteristic that allows them to outcompete native species. Um, so because they're new to a region, that can be predators not recognizing them or prey not recognizing them, um, or just an abundance of food resources to them. Um, so an example of uh, uh, non-native, but not necessarily invasive. So our first bullet point sort of describes uh, non-native species, um, but then more specifically, we got into invasives. So something that could be brought to a new area, but not necessarily having those harmful impacts. Um, in our marine ecosystem, an example of that would be a fairy basslet. So they are present in our waters, but we have not um, discovered any negative impacts that they are causing on the ecosystem around them. So I wanna show y'all the trend that invasive species tend to follow. And there can be variation in this, but on a whole, when an uh, organism is introduced to a new uh, place, it tends to follow a typical pattern. Um, and so you've got the bottom left here of an introduction and that's maybe a few individuals, maybe a few more get introduced and then you have enough to um, start breeding and expanding and you have that rapid growth upward. Um, and so that can be a, a boom in population. Usually there is a lag time after the first introduction, uh, just because it takes some time um, for enough individuals to create that breeding population. But you'll have that rapid growth and then something is going to cap the species out, um, whether that is food, um, predators, disease, something limits that growth from always going upwards. Um, and we call that carrying capacity, um, the capacity that an ecosystem has to sustain a given population. And so then you'll typically have a short decline and then it sort of levels out. And realistically, it still vacillates up and down, but that level population is sort of an average of where it lands. Um, and for lionfish, we are on the back half of this. Um, we've definitely passed introduction and rapid growth. Um, but then we will get into lionfish specifically. So that was a little bit about general uh, invasive species background. Um, and so then we'll get into lionfish. So um, across the world, there are 20 different species of lionfish, but here in their invaded range, we only have two species. Um, and so that's going to be the red lionfish and the fire devilfish. Um, and so that is here in um, Atlantic waters. They are originally from the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so that's Indian and Pacific Oceans. Um, and they're thought to be released through the aquarium trade in the mid eighties. And so they're beautiful fish um, in a tank. You can see from these pictures that they have very showy filamentous fins um, that for them act uh, as sort of a, um, 
safety mechanism that makes them look a lot bigger than they are. But to us, they just look like a beautiful fish. And so they're beautiful in a tank. But after a while, somebody uh, decided that they no longer wanted to care for these fish and um, decided to release them into the ocean. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of invasive species are first introduced from people. But they are now established in the Western Atlantic Ocean, um, down into the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean. Um, and so established just means that they are introduced and have um, uh, enough breeding individuals to maintain that population. And they're successfully reproducing and living in this new habitat. Um, and then something else really interesting about them is in this new area, um, because of a different set of uh, habitat traits, they are able to be more dense and in greater biomass than in their native range. Um, they're pretty solitary in their native range, so you wouldn't see more than a couple individuals on a reef area, but here you'll typically see um, a lot of individuals given the fishing effort. And they're also only able to reach about 15 inches in their native range. But here, um, our state record is just under 19 inches. Uh, so that 19 inch range is thought to be their maximum in this invaded range. And so um, if y'all keep that invasion trend in mind, I'm gonna show y'all some pictures of when they were first sighted um, and then where the sightings have gone over the last four decades. Um, so this is the first sighting off Dania Beach in 1985 in South Florida, and then um, we're going to show you a bunch of more sightings that show just how prolific they've become. Um, so these are going to be in five-year increments, uh, and it'll transition, and you'll start seeing more red dots pop up, and so you first get those few introduction sightings, and you'll really start seeing that um, rapid growth take off. And so now lionfish have been spotted off the coast of Brazil. So heading even further southeast uh, around the Caribbean Sea and into the South Atlantic. Um, and then we can also look at the top of the image around New England states where you really start to see them taper off. Um, and so I just want to point that out as one of their kind of cold thresholds up at the top where that is a limiting factor in where they can continue expanding. And so then we'll get into some of their habitat use. Uh, and so they're found in a very wide variety of, of structures and, and areas um, and under a bunch of different conditions. And so essentially there's no marine habitat that lionfish have not been able to invade in this new range. Um, and you'll see a, a very wide variety of depths from one to a thousand feet um, that cold tolerance that can show the upward boundary of their range, uh, and then some salinity variations anywhere from true seawater at about 35 parts per thousand down to um, much more fresh. Uh, and that's important because thinking of Indian River Lagoon area, um, there haven't been sightings in the area, but uh, if there were to be, it wouldn't uh, be extremely uh, out of the ordinary just because we have, it has been shown that lionfish can tolerate those types of conditions. And so they are also a demersal species, which means they're commonly found towards the bottom, towards the ocean floor. Um, and so they like to be under ledges or crevices or holes. They like to um, have hiding places. Um, where they can use ambush tactics or just hide from predators. Uh, they also have a very high sight fidelity, which means that um, individuals, adults, uh, are not going to travel very far distances. Their typical home range as an adult is about the size of a football field. So that's about the area that a given individual would travel over the course of its adult life. Um, so they might be able to, to travel from small reef to small reef, but not travel um, any significant, significant distances. So then if the adults aren't traveling, how do they travel? Um, well, it's really thought to be via their eggs. And so their eggs are very small and light. And so they're capable of traveling uh, distances over wind or current. Um, and so while the adults aren't really moving, um, once they spawn, their eggs can travel these great distances and uh, larval individuals can end up on reefs and then you have them in new areas. 
And so these are some of the characteristics that uh, contribute to its invasiveness. And so these fish mature more quickly than most other reef fish. So at a younger age, they're able to spawn, which allows them more spawning capability over the course of their life. And then they can also spawn very frequently in warm months. Uh, so they could be spawning for months as opposed to just a few days or weeks like some other fish. So that's a fairly unusual strategy, but is very beneficial for them because this in increases their chance of eggs um, surviving and reaching to maturity. Um, and then they can spawn an average of 30,000 eggs each time they spawn. So every two to four days, about 30,000 eggs. Um, and while this isn't that um, atypical because other fish do spawn in this types of quantity, many fish spawn in the tens of thousands, um, it is just that much more prolific because of how frequently they can spawn. So then other ways that they cause an impact is through everything that they're eating. So lionfish typically prey on juvenile fish from economically important species. So we've got some examples here of uh, grouper and flounder, some snapper, and then shrimp, crab, and lobster. And so this is really um, negative because when we're preying or when the fish are preying on these juvenile species, um, it takes a, a large chunk out of the population that never get to reach to maturity. So then those individuals never get to spawn and never get to continue contributing to the population. Um, and so it sort of stunts that population growth. And then uh, it also significantly uh, impacts the fisheries health. When these are directly important species to us, um, we're harvesting these fish and lionfish are also eating them. So you've just got more impact to each population um, than would have happened prior to lionfish being introduced. They also prey on and eat ecologically important species. So these are grazers and herbivores, things that maintain the balance of the ecosystem um, in a similar but different way than the other species that we touched on. Um, while we don't see those as economically important, they're very crucial to the ecosystem balance and corals being able to grow and get sunlight. Um, and so some of these examples would be parrotfish and wrasse removing algae that allows sunlight to get to the coral. Um, and that's how coral photosynthesizes food. And so with this sort of middle portion of your food web being taken out, it leaves a gap. And we heard a lot of last summer about uh, corals being stressed with the heat. And so when these uh, herbivores aren't there to help graze, that adds another layer of stress on these corals that can ultimately end up in um, a dying ecosystem. So kind of overall, how they're impacting, um, we've talked about some of the different things that they can eat, but I do want to point out that there have been over 90 different species of fish and invertebrates recorded in their stomachs. So they consume a very wide variety of uh, species, um, and they're also capable of preying on any individual that is up to half their own body size, um, which is pretty significant because that means even though a fish is not very large, it could eat something very comparably large. Uh, and so that reduces recruitment. We touched on how they eat the juveniles of a species, which then inhibits the species from being able to reproduce and continue to grow their population. And so there have been up to 80% reductions in juvenile fish recruitment um, on new reefs during, through various studies. Um, and so because they are new to an area and have not evolved alongside other species, there is no natural control mechanism. Um, there is in their native range, there are uh, species that eat their eggs and um, even juvenile lionfish, but here we just really don't have that. And so these individuals are allowed to make it to adulthood and reproduce, but also compete with other native species. And so because we don't have any um, natural control mechanism. Humans are really the only known predator. Um, and so they're the only thing removing these fish out of the ecosystem. And I will step back and touch on, um, there has been a skin lesion a few years back that caused a really big dent in the population, but not enough to consistently maintain 
um, and lower the populations enough to potentially eradicate these fish. So people are really the only thing that is making a consistent effort to remove the fish from the ecosystem. And so one of the difficulties of this is that um, lionfish have venomous spines. Uh, that's probably one of the more common things that people hear about lionfish. Um, and so they do have 18 venomous spines around their body. Um, if you look at the diagram on the bottom right, the red dots will show where their venomous spines are. And so that's gonna be dorsally and ventrally, the top and bottom of their body. Um, so they have spines, venomous spines on their dorsal fin, um, on each of their pelvic fins, and then on their anal fin. And so a uh, quick clarification on their venom uh, versus poison. Sometimes you might um, also hear that they are poisonous. That is not true. They are venomous. Um, and the distinction is that um, a poison is anything inhaled or ingested or absorbed. So think contact with the skin or lungs um, while venom is going to be injected. So it has to be some sort of puncture or poke. Um, so just thinking about that, it is okay to touch the outside of the fish or to even touch the outside of the spines. It's just, you really don't want to be poked. Um, but if you are never poked, you will not come in contact with that venom. Um, and so the venom is a neuromuscular toxin that causes pain. Um, and it varies from person to person, depending on, um, their condition and also where the wound is. Uh, but importantly, there have been no deaths reported from lionfish venom. We do still have recommendations on best treatment methods. So um, hot water is going to neural neutralize the venom. Um, and so if you are ever envenomated, um, we would recommend um, hot, but not scalding, please don't burn yourself, um, warm water or a heat pack or something to kind of break that poison down, but still definitely do seek medical attention for follow-up. Um, but um, with that being said, I also want to note that uh, the venom is only in their spines. We, we did mention that it's not on the outside of their body, but it's also not in their meat. It's not on the inside of their body. Um, and so their meat is perfectly safe, um, great to eat. Uh, it's a similar to snapper grouper, um, a white meat that's easily seasoned. Um, but we would just recommend it, recommend um, safety in filleting the fish. You want, just want to be a little bit more cautious than you would with other types of fish um, because of these spines. And so we'll get into harvesting lionfish. What does it look like to actually go out there, see these fish underwater um, and remove them from the ecosystem? These control mechanisms that we want people doing since nothing else is. Um, and so that looks like a, a pole spear or Hawaiian sling or some other simple spearing mechanism. It doesn't take anything extravagant. Um, lionfish really don't move or avoid until you're very, very close to them. Um, you can watch videos online even of spearing fish with other lionfish around and the other lionfish really don't react. So you can get numbers at a time. Um, without really chasing them down. So anyway, you've got pole spear and we would also recommend because of these venomous spines, some sort of puncture proof container, um, a solid containment device um, that is going to allow you to spear them and contain them without having any contact. That's really the goal is not having to touch these fish. So a lot of them will either have a funnel or a flap or something that's going to allow you to spear a fish um, and then put the fish and the pole spear into the container and pull it out and it'll help pull the fish off the pole spear. So then you can keep spearing and you don't have to touch the fish to take it off the pole spear. Um, so then just as an added safety measure, we would always recommend um, puncture resistant gloves just because things do happen underwater. Um, but we really want to emphasize that point of hands off underwater um, and being very cautious even when you are on land. So then another uh, component of harvesting them is that you don't need to have any sort of fishing license. A few years ago, the agency um, went in and took out really any boundaries to harvesting lionfish. Um, so there is no fishing license required, no size limit, no bag limit. And a bag limit is the number of individuals you can harvest at a given time. So there is no limit to what you can harvest and no season. So any time of year, any day, as many as you want, as small or as large, take them all. So that mostly wraps up our lionfish biology, 
um, and kind of telling about them and, and harvesting them. Uh, so then I want to get into some of our programs that we have as the agency. Uh, so we have a few different things that we work on, um, but I wanted to also open the door to give people a way to get involved. Um, and so, yeah, you know that there's a problem now. Now what? So uh, the goal of our program within the agency is to minimize those adverse impacts. We talked about that being a, a characterization of being an invasive species. So we want to minimize those negative impacts as best we can. And we do that through public awareness and education efforts, things like this. Um, we mostly do this on a um, as requested basis. So all of our different methods that we do, um, we really, really rely on people hearing about this um, and then asking us to come to these events. Um, and so if it is some sort of outdoor event or festival, we have a Be the Predator booth that an image is on the top center where we can set up um, information, brochures, um, uh, fun giveaway items, just really opening the door to have conversations about this um, and introduce it to people. Um, and then a little bit more in depth, we can do workshops in classroom, our classroom invasion workshops are more targeted toward dive shops or adult audiences. And our classroom invasion is more of a K through 12 um, classroom audience. And so we can do anything from dissections, activities, um, talk about spearing practice, ways to fillets, anything like that, um, that really get people hands on and interested. Uh, and then we also do have an educational exhibit program where we can offer funding to um, help entities around the state uh, support or create a exhibit that can reach beyond our education capabilities. So we get this uh, exhibit set up and then people can come in and out um, and see it for much longer than we can conduct one presentation. Um, but then secondarily to that, um, and really most importantly is our control programs, ways in which we can um, support people in getting out there and removing fish and ways that we can incentivize that um, and really make an impact in the ecosystem. And so uh, primarily with this, our goal is, like I said, to remove the fish, but we do also want to find a way to track what we've been removing because it's not a managed species the way other snapper or grouper would be. Um, we don't do uh, stock assessments or population estimates. So we really want to track as best we can what's being removed. What have we taken out um, over the years and how has that changed? because that could give us insight into their populations. And so we do this um, kind of in two different ways. There are a lot of local entities around the state that will uh, sponsor or host um, derbies and festivals. We can sponsor those. Um, these are both kind of targeting the same mission, just a different approach. So the first approach are these local derbies. Um, and so they're typically a couple days, um, teams. So groups of people will go out and harvest. Um, and so they're a very localized impact with focused efforts um, and having a really big uh, draw of people and participation will make a very big impact in a smaller given area. And so to kind of contrast that, the, create, the state has created um, a tournament that we uh, facilitate. Um, and so it's statewide, a uh, few months over the summer. And this is individual participation. So everybody tracks their own fish um, on their own as opposed to being in teams. Um, and we also have recreational and commercial categories. So even people who are selling these fish are welcome to participate. Um, and people who may have never harvested fish are welcome to start. Um, and so we're gonna get into a little bit more details of each of these, but they overall have the same goal. Um, we just wanna kind of go at it in different ways to see what different audience we can um, get involved. Um, and so for local derbies, like I said, it's typically uh, local entities that are starting this. So we want to be able to support them uh, in their efforts. And so we can do that through um, funding, through sponsorship. Um, so that's probably one of the most tangible ways. We have a funding program that allows support of up to $2,400 for programs. 
And those can be for lionfish specific derbies or even spearfishing tournaments that will have a lionfish category. Um, so maybe there is a tournament out there that wants to add that category. Um, we can help get that started. And then we're also happy to offer technical support. We're happy to talk through ideas, what others have tried, um, the best times or days or different things like that. Any ideas that have that, that you have that um, we might be able to see what's most realistic. Um, and then we're also happy to attend in person if there's a the festival associated. Like I said, we have a booth that we can bring um, and just be a very large presence, but also just attending tournaments to talk to people and make sure people are educated and safe. Um, and so these are really our priorities. And so if anybody out there is interested um, and wants to get involved, feel free to email lionfish at myfwc.com um, and we can get you started and get you resources. So then the other side of that, like I was talking about, is our lionfish challenge. Um, so this is a statewide, multi-month tournament um, that focused efforts over the summer months when people are most actively diving anyway, when you get better weather and water conditions. And so to do that, we partner with dive shops around the state. Last year, we had 54 participants. Um, so typically, there is always going to be something somewhere around, you know, if you're in a coastal area. Um, and so they act as a middleman with recreational participants. So as a recreational participant, you would um, turn in your harvest to checkpoints and then submit information to us for inputting. Um, but because it is so long, we have a bunch of different prizes. We have a pride tiered prize system where um, maybe you are that person that's going to be able to harvest hundreds of fish and really compete for that grand prize. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're just getting started and you want to start somewhere. Um, well, we'd love for you to participate also. And so prizes start at 25 fish. Uh, and so we have some product based things. Um, last year, some examples. Um, pole spears, zookeepers, um, t-shirts, coins. Um, and so that is one of our resource-based incentives. Um, we create a challenge point, design a challenge point every year. Um, and that allows anybody who reaches that tier and receives that coin, which is that first tier level 25 fish. It allows you to retain one spiny lobster over the bag limit each day during sport season. So as long as you reach that tier prior to sport season, you'll get your tournament shirt and your coin. And as long as you have your coin on you while you are harvesting fish, uh, you get to harvest an extra, or sorry, while you are harvesting lobsters, you can harvest one extra. So that's sort of a, a thank you for doing your part and removing these invasive species and a reward with native species. Um, and then any involvement in any capacity is always welcome. Um, and that gives everybody an opportunity to get involved at any point. But that is pretty much everything that we have going on. So I know we're going to open the floor to questions here. But if anybody has any other questions that maybe come up down the road or wants that contact information again, wants to get involved, feel free to reach out. Um, Either any of these ways are great. It's just probably easier to spell lionfish than my last name. But um, yeah, thank you all so much for having me. And we can transition and open the floor for questions. I don't know if something changed. Can you still hear me? I can't hear you. Were you muted? Are we back to issues?
Okay, I'm trying different audios. Oh, other people cannot hear you either. I don't know if your computer microphone might be off. Well, I do see a couple of the questions here in our, our Q&A pop up, um, so I can start with those. And if you all have anything else come up or if you get back online, <laughs> we can go for that, too. Um, but so question, can a snorkeler find lionfish or a scuba necessary? Um, like the presentation showed, they can be in various depths. So you can find them snorkeling or free diving. Um, based on my experience in talking with people, that's most commonly going to be around South Florida or the Keys, where you do get a lot more shallow reefs. Um, or if you are just that person that can free dive to 30 feet or so, that's not me. Um, I scuba. Um, and so it's not 100% a requirement. We do periodically have people tell us about harvesting lionfish um, from snorkeling or, or free diving, but I would say the majority is going to be scuba. That's going to be a, a really big requirement and make it a lot easier. Um, and then second, oh, I'm still not hearing you. Are other people hearing her? Okay, we're still getting a no. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, not doing population assessments. Um, it's really just um, a resource, um, a capacity of the agency and other organizations when we have so many other species that um, are more economically and recreationally important, um, that's gonna take priority and while we do want to know their population size, they are extremely hard to sample because they do not bite a hook and line. So while we talked about um, spearing being the most effective method, it really is the case because it's only sporadically that, that lionfish are gonna bite hook and line. So most of our sampling methods are going to be from um, diving and spearfishing, but we're only kind of getting the top portion of their range because they live at depths up to a thousand feet and we just can't dive that deep. So we really don't have um, a great way to fully sample. We can sample and then extrapolate, but um, we don't have a ton of really great studies showing um, just what their population distribution looks like. Um, to the full extent of their depth. So it's one really difficult um, and two just having the manpower and funding to even be able to do that is a really big barrier. Um, so I will keep scrolling. What part of the lionfish do you eat? Um, you would eat the side portion of their body, their um, muscle, their filet, the same that you would any other fish. So if you think of um, I don't know if you've ever seen a video of someone filleting a fish or if, if, if you've done it yourself, but lionfish would be similar. Um, a, a way to help kind of minimize those negative impacts would be to either cut the spines off before you fillet, or just like I said, be very mindful and cautious. Um, if you're harvesting them and putting them on ice, you're really not going to, it's, it's not like the lionfish is flopping or anything. So it's just paying attention to where you're placing your hands. Um, I will also note that they typically have um, some projections around their face that help for defense for them. They can be really sharp. So that would just be another thing to be mindful of, um, that it's uh, spines and also around their face, kind of that harder bony area. Um, so another question, do you anticipate climate change to expand their range? Um, it very well could because um, what we're seeing of their northernmost range is definitely a temperature threshold. So if temperatures change, that that um, latitude could very well change also. And right now we're mostly only seeing them over the summer in those areas. So it wouldn't be year round because they do get colder temperatures during the winter. Um, but yes, that range could change. 
how long does it take for a lionfish to grow 15 inches? Um, that is uh, highly variable. So um, it's going to depend on food resources and basically how much energy from what they're consuming can they put towards growing um, versus just maintaining their size. Um, so it could be a range, but it could be a few years. Um, you would typically see, I'm trying to think about like a age length um, curve. Mm, yeah, probably around a few years. Does anybody have anything else? Or have, have any of these questions brought up new questions? I'm not seeing it still, or I'm not hearing it. I'm seeing it. <laughs> One more question, okay. Oh, there we go. Just need to scroll a little bit more. I've been on night dives where grouper followed us and ate the lionfish after spearing. I asked the dive master later if it harmed the grouper and they said no. So, that can be commonly seen where either um, shark, grouper, eel would typically be your types of things. They will take it off a pole spear. So we would highly recommend not um, offering it up to a fish. Obviously, if you if you spear something and it's just taken off your spear, there, there are only so many things that you can limit underwater. Um, we would just really recommend not offering it to a shark or grouper or something because um, while it may be thought that that can teach the grouper how to eat lionfish, really what it's doing is associating the shark or a grouper or eel with humans as a food source. That when a lionfish is speared, that's when I can eat it. Not necessarily just I can eat a lionfish, which just is very personifying of fish. They don't quite think like that. Um, but um, that's sort of tangential to your question. Just would recommend not happening because then that ends up with these individuals coming closer to people when other people are out diving. Um, so question about um, lionfish harming grouper. There have been studies that have shown um, inflammation in a uh, grouper's uh, esophagus stomach. So it can harm them to a degree and that it's gonna cause inflammation or target that nervous system, but not to an extreme degree that it's going to kill this fish or that they might even learn to stop eating them. So not, not in a capacity um, that is going to be deadly or anything. But that is a good note. Um, lionfish are typically, or can also be found to be um, more active at night. So just your comment about night diving. <laughs> uh, or y'all are very welcome thanks for everyone for coming out today um and for tuning in and like i said if you have any other questions please feel free to um reach out but yeah thank y'all everybody have a great day